first Sunday of Advent. Hey everyone, it's Matt here, and this is One Minute for Mass. We're coming up to the first Sunday of Advent, which means Christmas is just around the corner. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus challenges us to stay awake. Now, I love my naps as much as the next parent, but Jesus is talking about a spiritual state of being awake. So the question for us is, what's keeping us from being spiritually awake in our everyday lives and routines? Or what can we do to make sure that we're not falling asleep in a spiritual sense? I know for me, there are some common trends that I really struggle with. In particular, busyness and distraction, they can become big obstacles in my spiritual well-being. What about you? What in your everyday life might be keeping you from being fully awake for God? This Sunday, the church and Jesus, they're challenging us to make sure that we're fully awake in everything we do and not just going through the motions as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. I'll see you guys at Mass. Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. The Lord will gather all nations into the eternal peace of the kingdom of God. This is what Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. All nations shall stream toward it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come. Let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and impose terms on many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The Word of the Lord Happy New Year! Today is the beginning of the Church's liturgical New Year. The office of prophet was instituted during Samuel's time. We don't know the exact date of his birth but, because of hints in scripture it is estimated to be between 1200 and 1050 BC. Prophets spoke for God who challenged the people and their leaders with God's commands and promises. Because of their confrontational stance and the people's tendency to disobey God, they became very unpopular with their listeners. 
Isaiah called people to turn away from sin and turn toward God, if they didn't, God's retribution lay in their future. Isaiah's ministry lasted for about 60 years before being executed by the king. Isaiah died a martyr's death. By order of the Jewish king Manasseh he was killed when he was cut through by a wood saw. Isaiah is the first and longest book of prophets of the Bible. The temple was built on the mountain of the Lord, Mount Moriah, highly visible to all the people of Jerusalem. In the last days the temple will attract the nations, not because of its architecture or prominence, but because of God's presence and influence. God showed Isaiah what would eventually happen to Jerusalem. Revelation 21 tells about the glorious fulfillment of this prophecy in the New Jerusalem, where only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be allowed to enter. God made a covenant, promise, with his people and will never break it. Two phrases of Isaiah are often quoted and certainly linked with the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 and 6, But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole, by his stripes we were healed. Because we had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Walk in the light describes a wonderful future of peace when tools of war will be converted to farming tools. Although we know that eventually God will remove all sin, which leads to war, conflicts, and other problems, we should not wait for him to act before we begin to obey him. We should walk in his light now, just as Judah was told to do. Though our eternal reward awaits us, we already can enjoy many benefits of obedience now as we apply God's word to our life. In the upper room, and on Calvary's hill, Jesus teaches us that the most important aspects of a well-lived life are love, humility, and obedience. Joan Campbell Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced because they said to me, We will go up to the house of the Lord. And now we have set foot within your gates, O Jerusalem. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Jerusalem built as a city with compact unity to it the tribes go up the tribes of the Lord let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord according to the decree for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. In it are set up judgment seats, seats for the house of David. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. May peace be within your walls. Prosperity in your buildings. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Because of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. 
because of the house of the Lord our God. I will pray for your good. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122 verses 1 to 9 Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced because they said to me, We will go up to the house of the Lord and now we have set foot within your gates, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem built as a city with compact unity, to it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, according to the decree for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, in it are set up judgment seats, seats for the house of David, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, may those who love you prosper, may peace be within your walls, prosperity in your buildings. Because of my brothers and friends, I will say, Peace be within you, because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will pray for your good. Psalms 120 to 134 are called the Songs of the Ascents, because they were sung by pilgrims on their way up to Jerusalem. You will recall Jerusalem is on a mountain top, so as pilgrims left the Jericho's river valley and began their 3,800 foot climb to the holy city, along the way they would recite these Psalms. Jerusalem's city walls give the impression of strength, once you are there, you feel like a real member of the people of God, if you observe the Lord's decrees. Deuteronomy 12 verses 5 to 7 speaks about the temple which unifies the people of God, in one location. Instead, you shall resort to the place which the Lord, your God, chooses out of all your tribes and designates as his dwelling, and there you shall bring your holocausts and sacrifices, your tithes, and personal contributions, your votive and free will offerings, and the firstlings of your herds and flocks. There, too, before the Lord, your God, you and your families shall eat and make merry over all your undertakings, because the Lord, your God, has blessed you. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verses 16 to 17. Three times a year, then, every male among you shall appear before the Lord, your God, in the place which he chooses, at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of booths, no one shall appear before the Lord empty-handed. But each of you with as much as he can give, in proportion to the blessings which the Lord, your God, has bestowed on you. The Church uses this psalm on the first Sunday of Advent, to emphasize Christian unity, and the centrality of the Church in the life of Christians, as we await the second coming of Christ, and the establishment of a kingdom of justice and peace. I recall my first pilgrimage to Bosnia, war had ended, but a rekindling of the war was still on the horizon as evidenced by the presence of I-Force personnel and equipment. The closer we came to our destination the easier it was to focus on our goal, and war, or threat of war, were no longer a concern or focus of our thinking. We were on our way to visit a holy place of God. If God wants to take you in the streets of your hometown he will. If he wants to take you in Bosnia he will. Why worry, God, is in control, you aren't. The Jewish pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem held the same joyful attitude, and focus, as they sung psalms of the ascent. Again, in the south of Ireland, I saw many people publicly praying the rosary on their way to work in the morning, which showed to their observers the importance of Catholicism to these individuals, practicing this public display of worship. As the Jewish pilgrims made their climb to Jerusalem, other travelers, merchants, soldiers, and foreigners must have heard them praying. Their example of devotion might have led others to God, we don't know, but it is possible. Are we like these pilgrims, as we approach Sunday Mass, have we looked at the readings before Mass, are we thrilled by the opportunity to worship God in God's house and in public? But the hour is coming and is now here, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, and indeed the Father seeks such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Romans 13 verses 11 to 14 Our salvation is nearer. Brothers and sisters, you know the time. It is the hour now for you to awake from sleep. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is advanced. 
the day is at hand. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and lust, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. The Word of the Lord. Before studying this reading let's back up a few verses in order to put this reading into perspective. Romans 13 verse 8 to 10, Owe nothing to anyone, except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, You shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this saying, namely, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor, hence, love is the fulfillment of the law. Turning to Matthew 22 verses 36 to 40 we hear Jesus explain the identical concept when he responds to the young lawyer's questions. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Clearly, Paul is echoing Jesus by saying, you will be following all the commandments if you love God and your neighbor. Three of the commandments have to do with your relationship with God, and the remaining seven cover transgressions against you neighbor or those around you. In today's reading Paul is telling us to become more Christ-like, a faithful, obedient, Loving Christian grows spiritually by modeling their life after that of Christ, as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, His light, His truth, His love become embedded in our day-to-day -day life. It is interesting that the word Christian was first used by the Gentiles of Antioch Syria as a put-down of Jesus' followers. In their language Christian meant little Christs. Isn't that what Paul is asking us to become? We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. Jesus said to his disciples, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So will it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be left out in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this. If the master of the house had known the hour of night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you the truth. 
this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and Earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the sun, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? whom the master is put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, today we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent, which means what? Four weeks. Happy New Year. That's right. Good, good. But uh, four more, four weeks, and we're in, in, in Christmas, right? So we're going to be celebrating Christmas. And this uh, Advent is known, of course, as the preparation time before Christmas. And it's a really, it's threefold. It's preparation for preparing ourselves, awaiting awaiting the coming of Christ as we saw it in history and as he came in, as the first time in, in, in when he was the incarnation of him becoming man. But also it's, it's an awaiting and a preparing ourselves to receive him in the Word and in the Eucharist, which we, do, we, pre, we receive him now. We await we, and prepare ourselves for that. And of course, the third part is to prepare ourselves for his second coming. I hope you all had a very good Thanksgiving. I'm going to have a nice time on Thanksgiving with visited family and friends, right? Right? Great, great. I heard uh, Orlando made the national news the other day off her Black Friday. It was in the national news that two women were fighting each other for a television set at, on, uh, at Target, right? Did you see that in the news? It was in the national news yet. They were arguing about who's going to take this 46-inch TV. So how many of you were, uh, went shopping last Friday? See, nobody raises their hand now, I tell you. <laughs> okay, I was there, yeah. You know, Advent can be caught up. We can get caught up in, during this season uh, in all, the, all the, the extra things regarding uh, preparing for Christmas, going out and buying things. And, and the focus of our call is not physical, it should be spiritual. 
It's sad, you know, you turn on the radio, the, the day after uh, Thanksgiving, the, all the radio stations are having Christmas celebrate music on the radio, you know? It's, and what always amazes me is, come Christmas Day is the last day. And we miss the whole, the whole sense of Christmas and preparation for Christmas and the celebration of Christmas, which follows Christmas Day. We are called to remember and prepare ourselves. We hear in the gospel today, we hear Jesus telling us, he says, well, when you prepare yourselves for my coming again, he says, remember, it was just like in the days of Noah. You all know the story of Noah, right? You know, the guy with the big boat, right? And all the animals, right? Good. I, you know, with Catholics, you know, some Catholics don't think they know the, the Bible, but so you do know this passage, right? You know, the story of Noah, and, and we hear the story that Noah was building this massive ark and everyone was making fun of him and joking about him and everything else. And, you know, I always think of this, this story and the first thing I think of is, wonder what those people were thinking and saying to themselves when it started to rain. You know? When the water started going up and up and up and they were making fun of poor Noah and all of a sudden they're thinking, oh, what happened? Dumkoff, I should have been listening. Right? The message always turns to us and he, and he tells us that story and he tells us the story so we remember that how many times we see things in our lives and we think, oh, I should have, I could have, I would have, if. And he's telling us, when it comes to your relationship with God, there is no if, there is no could have, should have, would have. You have to commit. And that's what you people are doing too. We have to commit ourselves to the Lord. And that's what this whole season is about. How we are committing ourselves to God. How we are making ourselves Christian and becoming different than those around us. How we are acknowledging God's blessings and going forth and showing others. Now, I tell you, the Christmas season, the preparation of Christmas is like most people are talking about their families and gathering together without, with each other. And, you know, I know how that goes. Oh, we're going over to my mother-in-law's house. Oh. Oh. And now, don't we hear that? Yeah. Oh, no, you don't say that. Yeah, but I, you know, but that's what, that's what I hear from people. You think, and that's not just in the, that's not in the confessional at all. You know, <laughs> they, they blatantly say that, you know, but the fact is, is that we, you know, our, I had, we had, we had, how many of you had, were at Thanksgiving meal and had little confrontation, right? You know, we have, oh, my sister or my brother or my niece or grandchildren. Oh, they're not doing what they're supposed to do or whatever. And we realize that the con it's confrontation that we see. And we hear in the passage today, we hear in the passage, in the first reading, we hear that, that in the Old Testament, Isaiah turns, turns around and says, when, when God comes... He will define a kingdom where there, there is no confrontation. He says, people, countries and people will not be at war. People, there will be peace and understanding. There will be the symbol of God's love. What do you hear in the news? So not only uh, the people are, are fighting each other for TV sets, right? But we hear, what else is in the news today? Korea. Korea. What's going on there? Korea, not good, no. It sounds like, you know, years ago, but the, here we have conflict between countries, conflict between people. And the message is, with God brings peace. So we have to put ourselves in the peace of God. This is a season where we call ourselves to be with the Lord and not be with things and we're going to be so overly concerned. 
You know, the, face is, the fact is, is our society and, our, and our, the people that we see and, uh, and society is telling us during this time of year, go off and go out and buy and go out and do this and put decorations up in your houses and everything else. And we seem to forget that the whole purpose is to look at ourselves and say, where, what am I celebrating? I'm celebrating God in my life. God has come down to us and made himself known. His love is present and I am a part of that. That's the message he tells us. And how do we do that? Well, Paul tells us. Did anybody have that reading today? Did you see? listen to that reading? That reading there? Oh, okay, I like this one. He says, put on the armor of light. Let us conduct your, ourselves properly as in the days, not in orgies and drunkenness. Any takers there? <laughs> it's, it's like going to go shopping on Friday, Good Friday, or the Black Friday. Or, well, better than that. Not promiscuity and lust. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll even make it even easier for you. Not in rivalry and jealousy. Gotcha. You may not admit to the others, but I got you on that one. Right? Paul turns to us, and he, he tells in that second reading, he turns to us and makes us, he says, he, I want you to be aware. He says, he thinks, you know, Jesus is coming a second time, and it's going to be right around the corner. And he tells them how to respond. That we have to put, put aside what, what our desires and our, our, our what, what he says, what is, what is taking us, is the flesh that is taking us away from our relationship with God. And let's face it, we get so caught up with the things of the flesh during, during the Christmas season, you know, how big of a television set we're going to get, and how big, you know, what all sorts of things that we're going to give, all the things... And we seem to forget what is spiritual in our relationship. Christmas is a time to prepare ourselves spiritually. Advent is that season that turns to us and makes us in tune to what God has in store for us and that we want to be a part of his kingdom. And to be a part of his kingdom doesn't, doesn't find yourself at the, at the store buying a TV, but to find yourself in relationship with God and your brothers and sisters. One that shares the love of God. One that becomes more in tune to where my heart should be. Today is, is a, a, you know, the beginning of the Advent season, and we are called to be able to look at ourselves, to spend time. Now, I know Advent is one of those hectic times. When I was a kid, by the way, which wasn't too long ago, but the fact was, I, when I was a kid, I remember once Thanksgiving came and we saw, you saw the Macy's parade on, on, on TV, and I thought, well, you know, Christmas couldn't come soon enough, right? You remember those days? You know, in those days, you know, Christmas, I mean, my word, it's four long weeks. Now that I'm a little bit older, <laughs> it comes too quick, Right? It's there. And all of a sudden, all the things that you have to do, and you get so caught up in such, such a whirlwind that you seem to forget that this is a period of time that I should be preparing myself. My relationship with God. What do I need to do to change? What do I need to... Can I turn around tomorrow and say, I'm ready for your coming, Lord? You know, this is what Jesus is telling us in this story. He's telling us, you know, people can get caught up in all the things around them that they don't see Noah building a gigantic ark in the desert and really wonder, gee, what's going on there? Well, you know, we are called and we see our own lives. The church has been telling us all our lives to get our act together to be able to, you know, to look, look at the scriptures and see what God has calling us to be, to raise ourselves up. And then we seem to think, well, I'll do that later. 
You know, when we are younger, we think, well, we got all the time in the world, right? I'll do that after I sow my wild oats. You know what they are, right? right? You know what they are. I... Okay, well, you let me know later on, okay? <laughs> the fact is that we are here to remind ourselves that we don't have that much time. We don't. It may be four short weeks to Christmas, but who knows how short it is to the time we meet our Maker. And we are called to present ourselves before the Lord. We are called to be ready at any moment to live the life in Christ with the great expectation that he will be here any moment of our lives. That is living out the faith. That's not waiting to the last moment and saying, well, if I'm lucky, I'll get there. Our relationship with, the, with Christ himself should always be constant. And this is that season where we look at ourselves and say, hey, what do I need to do to become one with the Lord. Now, we have three people here that have come before us, who have been baptized, and now they want to become full members of the Catholic Church. And they've come in to, and to a greater, to me, I look at that as that, that they're, they're going, wanting to have a greater relationship with God through the Catholic Church. That they are being called to be different, to, be, to strengthen their faith. Their faith has been there, They've accepted Christ in baptism, and now they want to go a little bit step further. Well, that should be all of us. We should be constantly making that step further, constantly working to become closer to the Lord. That's what this season is all about. My, my goal to you, my statement to you today, is you only have four weeks. Don't waste some, all that time. Have some time in there to give and check yourself, to spend some time with the Lord, to see what you need to do to be in true relationship with God. That's preparing yourself, not only for the coming of Christ the second time, but that's truly preparing yourself for the celebration of Christmas as well. Jesus answers the question his disciples asked him in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, about when he will come again. This Sunday's gospel is from Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 through 44. Jesus said to his disciples, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So will it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinded at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour of night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too, you also must be prepared. For at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come. In Advent, we always prepare for Jesus to come. In the first Sunday in Advent, we always hear about his second coming, when he will come at the end of the world. He is saying that we must be vigilant, which means alert or awake. We must also pray to Jesus to help us avoid the dangers of sin. Bye, see you next time. Hey, give me back my flower.
This is a homily for the first Sunday in Advent. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, verses 37 to 44. Last Sunday I indicated that my homily for the Feast of Christ the King would be my last homily until I return from sabbatical leave in mid-April. It was something I prayed over whether or not I should continue my homilies during the time of my sabbatical leave, and I asked for the Lord's guidance. And having the story of Gideon in mind, the story is recorded in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, I asked for a sign. My homilies had been averaging about 6,000 views a week in recent times, peaking once or twice at 10,000. I would take it as a sign from God that I should continue with my homilies if the number of views for my Christ the King homily exceeded 12,000. Well, as you can see, the number of views far exceeded 12,000. So I shall continue with my weekly homilies during my period of sabbatical leave. Today, on this first Sunday in Advent, we begin the Church's new liturgical year. So, Happy New Year! And with this new liturgical year, we commence reading from Year A in the lectionary's three yearly cycle of readings. Year A is the year of Matthew. So that means that on most Sundays of this liturgical year, the Gospel will come from the Gospel of St. Matthew. So over the next 12 months, we'll have an opportunity to reflect upon the distinctive insights that Matthew's Gospel offers us into the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Let's come back to the Church's liturgical cycle for a moment. As you can see, there are two periods of preparation in the Church's year, and they're coloured purple in this diagram. The 40 days of Lent are a preparation for the celebration of Easter, and the weeks of Advent are a preparation for the celebration of Christmas. But each of these seasons has its own distinctive character. Lent is a period of repentance. If we lived in the Northern Hemisphere, we could call it a time of spring cleaning, spring cleaning of our lives. Even though in the Southern Hemisphere we begin Lent in 2020 during the last days of our summer, it is nevertheless a kind of spring cleaning, a time to confront ourselves about the direction of our lives. Advent is a season of hope. We anxiously await the arrival of a special guest. The word Advent comes to us from the Latin. The verb Advento means to come nearer and nearer, or to be on the point of arriving. So Advent is a time of expectant waiting, of hopeful anticipation, and of joyful preparation. Note the colour of Advent. It's not the white or gold that we use for Christmas, Epiphany and Easter. Nor is it the red that we use for Good Friday and Pentecost. Nor is it the green of ordinary time. The colours of Advent are purple and rose, just like the candles on the Advent wreath. A new candle is lit each week. The third week is rose-coloured for Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete is a Latin word meaning rejoice or be glad. In other words, don't lose heart. And why? Because the expected guest has almost arrived. Advent is not about waiting in line to see Santa, nor is it rushing around shopping for Christmas presents. The Australian cartoonist Michael Lunig offers this interesting reflection on Christmas. Santa, Santa in your sleigh, come and take my toys away. 
while I'm sleeping in my cot, visit me and take the lot. Santa, Santa, set me free, clear an open space for me, me and all the girls and boys buried under heaps of toys. Santa, Santa, with your sack, come and take some plastic back, take it back, and in its place, leave a little breathing space. Some breathing space. This is what Advent is about, a time to focus on what is truly important in our lives. So Advent is a time of waiting, expecting, hoping, anticipating, longing, yearning, searching, listening. To understand Advent a little better, come with me to the Ponte Frabiccio. It's the oldest bridge in Rome still existing in its original state. It was built in 62 BC and spans half of the Tiber River, from the Campus Martius on the east side to the Tiber Island in the middle. You'll see on the bridge a well-worn stone carving. It represents the Roman god Janus, who is the Roman god of beginnings. Now Janus is always depicted with one head but two faces looking in opposite directions as you can see on this coin. The month of January, the beginning of our new year, is named after Janus, the god of beginnings. And I guess that at the beginning of a new year we often do look in two directions. We look backwards and we look forwards. We look back over the past year and we look forward in hope to the year that has just begun. And that is what we do at Advent. We look back to the first coming of Christ at Bethlehem. One of our best-known Advent hymns captures the mood of this season. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. You see, for the thousand years between King David and his son Solomon and the birth of Jesus, the Jewish people had been conquered by one superpower after another. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks. And when Jesus was born, it was the Romans. So they longed and yearned for God to send them another anointed one, like David, who would set them free. I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to see the whole of the Old Testament as a time of Advent, a time of waiting, waiting for the Messianic age. During Advent, we also look forwards to the second coming of Christ. And today's Gospel warns us to stay awake, to stand ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour we do not expect. Stay awake. If the householder had known at what time of the night the burglar would come, he would have stayed awake and would not have allowed anyone to break through the wall of his house. Stay awake. So, we look back 2,000 years to the first coming of Christ and we look forward to his second coming at a time we do not know. But Advent is also about now, about the present moment, about Christ's coming among us today. The Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis is a series of 31 letters written by a senior devil, Screw Tape, to his inexperienced nephew, Wormwood. Wormwood needs tuition and guidance in the art of luring souls into hell. Wormwood tells his nephew about a patient he once had. He refers, by the way, to the souls he's coaxing into hell, his patients. 
This person was a sound atheist who used to read in the library. One day, Screwtape saw a train of thought in his mind that was beginning to go the wrong way. Oh, we don't want this patient beginning to question his atheism. The enemy was at his elbow in a moment. Screwtape, you'll notice, refers to God as the enemy. Before I knew where I was, I saw my twenty years' work beginning to totter. So what should he do? Well, he tells us. If I had lost my head and begun to attempt a defence by argument, I should have been undone. But I was not such a fool. In other words, it won't work if I start arguing with him. Let's try another tactic. I struck instantly at the part of the man which I had best under my control. I suggested that it was just about time he had some lunch. Now, Screwtape isn't able to hear what God whispers into someone's ear, but in this case, he could guess. The enemy, presumably, made the counter-suggestion that this was more important than lunch. Screwtape realises that it's best not to argue. The best tactic is to agree. I said, quiet! In fact, much too important to tackle at the end of a morning. Much better come back after lunch and go into it with a fresh mind. And he was already halfway to the door. Once he was in the street, the battle was won. Screwtape had employed a very beguiling tactic. Of course you need to think about this matter more seriously, but not now. Leave it until later. Not now. There's plenty of time later. Advent summons us to be awake today, to this present moment, to what God is saying to us here and now. Hi friends, it's the first Sunday of Advent, and you know what that means? Happy New Year! It's the beginning of the liturgical New Year in the Catholic Church. And the beginning, we start with this period of preparation that we all know is Advent, a preparation for the birth of Christ on the Solemnity of the Nativity of our Lord, December 25th. I can't wait. But what the Church says about this season particularly is this, and let me read it for you from the Roman Missal. The church says this, it says that Advent has a twofold character, for it's a time of preparation for the solemnity of Christmas in which the first coming of the Son of Man to humanity is remembered, and likewise it's a time by remembrance of this, minds and hearts are led to look forward to the second coming at the end of time. And for these two reasons, Advent is a period of devout and expectant delight. So Advent is absolutely a period of preparation for this beautiful solemnity, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. However, it doesn't carry the same character of penitence and sobriety that Lent would. It's a time of delight, of expectant delight and preparation for our Lord. Now it also describes Advent as remembering the first coming of Christ and preparing for his second coming. But it also invites us to think of a third coming of Christ. And what is that third coming? That's Christ right now in the fullness of grace, inviting me, Sister Allison, with the grace of this moment to respond to him ever anew. Conversion, repentance, growth, a yes to our Lord in the fullness of life. But it also is that third coming of his presence right now also invokes a sense he comes to us at the end of our earthly life. Yes, Christ is coming, and in the season of Advent, let's prepare for the coming of our Lord. And like the Gospel says, stay awake, for Christ is coming. We do not know the hour. So that brings us to a question of then, how do we prepare with expectant delight? How do we allow our hearts to long for this coming of our Lord? 
I would invite you to increase devotion in your life. And what I mean by devotion is practices of devotion, like visits to our Lord in the Eucharist, or even concrete daily times of prayer in your day. As if we sit and are spending time in the presence of our beloved Lord, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who comes as our Savior and King, if we spend daily time in His presence, He reveals, as the light, He reveals those areas still in darkness in our life or in our heart, and He also um, invites our hearts to taste His sweetness, to know Him, Him who loves us, and who is desiring to bring us into communion with Him eternally in heaven. So friends, let the desire for Christ's presence and His coming into our life be stirred and set aflame through practices of devotion in the season of Advent. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Happy New Year. Be prepared. Upon hearing the Scout motto, Someone asked the scouting founder Robert Baden Powell the inevitable follow up question, prepared for what, why, for any old thing, he replied. In 1907, Baden Powell, an English soldier, devised the scout motto, Be Prepared. He published it in Scouting for Boys in 1908. Two years later, in 1910, the Boy Scouts of America was founded. In Scouting for Boys, Baden Powell wrote that to be prepared means you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. More than a century later, preparedness is still a cornerstone of scouting. Through its fun, values-based program, scouting prepares young people for life. In the early 1900s, Baden Powell wanted young people equipped to react quickly to an emergency. The Great War, World War I, loomed and soon the Boy Scouts not a military organization but a service-minded one would be called upon to play their part as England's Coast Watchers. In 1940 England was about to be invaded by Nazi Germany. The Germans were already bombing London, in an effort to invade and defeat the English. Again the Boy Scouts became volunteer Coast Watchers. Remember, the English didn't have radar or satellites, so the only way to detect an attack was to see the incoming bombers. Once seen the general population was notified to go to bomb shelters. This action saved thousands of lives. Their keen eyes were added to the watchers along the coasts, Winston Churchill wrote in a piece published in Scouting magazine in 1955. In the air raids we saw the spectacle of children of 12 and 14 performing with perfect coolness and composure the useful functions assigned to them in the streets and public offices. If children understood, even at the age of 12, the need to be prepared for the coming bombing raids, to warn civilians to take cover and save their lives, why can't we too understand the need to be prepared, and to save our own eternal lives, at the time of our death, and, or at the second coming of Christ? When will we die? When will the rapture or the second coming of Christ be? Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 verse 36, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, uh, but the Father only. I recall asking my dad when I would die, he told me he didn't know, that was a shock, I thought he knew everything. He then followed it up with, live each day as if it is your last day on earth, one day you will be right. Stay awake, and be prepared. If you take unacceptable risks, you have to be prepared to face the consequences. Carly Fionina Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 to 44 Like the master of the house, be prepared. When it comes to being on alert and ready at any moment to do the job, it's hard to beat the Pony Express. This historically famous mail service between St. Joseph, Missouri and California depended on constant movement and readiness. Relay stations were established every 10 to 15 miles. A rider would shout aloud as he approached his station, giving the station master very short notice that he needed to be outside waiting with a fresh mount. Even when a rider came to a station where he was to spend the night, another rider was already mounted and waiting, ready to grab the first rider's bundle of packages and continue the trip. The completion of the transcontinental telegraph system rendered the Pony Express obsolete after just 18 months, but we have this service's intriguing example of what it means to be watchful. 
Are you like the station master, ready, not for the rider, but for the day the Lord calls you to join him? Are you ready for the approach of God's rider? You and I are in a war, in a conflict, and we are given these instructions. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 11 and 12 Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. From the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. From the first letter of Peter, chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. When no one is watching, are you living each day as if it were your last? So, too, you must be prepared. For at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come.